So what do we have today? The next generation of auto could determine RAW versus JPEG. Let's focus on that. Hey everybody and welcome to Aperture Chat. I'm Tom. And I'm Ryan. And I'm sure Elliot will pop his head up around here at some point. Yeah. He still has more Twitter followers than I do. Yeah, that's because you're terrible. I am a terrible, terrible Twitter person. Um, so before we get to the obnoxious thing from the bump, uh, we are going to keep doing our ISS news, which is apparently now two weeks in a row, so now it's a thing. There's always something. Astronaut Reed Weissman uses a floating sphere of water as the ultimate fisheye lens. So on the ISS, obviously, there's a very little gravity. So when water is floating, it's floating in a perfect sphere. And when you use that as a camera, put a camera behind the sphere of water, and it works like a fisheye lens. It looks like a really cool fisheye lens. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, so he was talking about why, and it, this is one of those... The ISS often puts out little videos about stuff on space, and they, they take questions, and they answer them on Twitter. All the astronauts have Twitter. Yep. So it's really fun for them to just do whatever they want to do. So this must have been an interesting little either question or just something that they come up with. Yeah, someone probably just sent up a tweet. Hey, you know, I don't know. I don't oh, know it, was it was well, a vine. Well, they put it out as a vine. So this is a, the, the frame cap I have here is actually a cap from the vine. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they, you know, they, I'll have to go follow him on Vine. I had him on Twitter. I missed that. <laughs> Freaking. Yeah, so he, he uploaded the very first vine from space. Yeah, good for him. Yeah. So... I mean, he has to, somebody has to live up after Hadfield's, like, Hadfield spent so much time on the internet just doing random things. Oh, yeah. So, apparently, Reed Weissman is the guy doing that now, which is good. Yeah. But, yeah, it's a really cool little, you could, you could it really is like the ultimate fisheye, because it's just like, bloop. <laughs> I don't know what bloop means. I just said that. that. Bloop is the right. All right. Definitely. So, so that's our fun and, fun and space segment. Yeah. Well, one, what else I'm going to put that up. It's going to be like, fun in space. No? Okay. Nah. Um, it's just some serious business. It's playing with water in space. Space is serious business. Just ask Richard Branson. <laughs> so anyway, back here on Earth, and as I talked about in the bump, uh, you may have a new auto feature in your next generation Canon camera. Uh, Canon uh, applied for a patent and was granted it back in August. Uh for a algorithm that would determine whether a shot should have been captured in RAW or JPEG using things like contrast and sharpness and all this. So you could burst shoot and it would only save the good pictures in RAW and it would put your other pictures in JPEG so you still had them. Hmm. It's, I mean, if it was perfect, it'd be an interesting thing to... Yeah, I, I would never use this. No. I would just keep it in RAW. I mean, unless it was, you know, so tried and tested that it was perfect. Like, autofocus is one of those things that you'd say you'd never use when it was a first a thing. Yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, that'd be an interesting, like, if it was actually perfected, it'd be yeah. very cool. And I, I can see part of where they're coming from. It is faster to write JPEGs because they're smaller files. But you're taking time to do this. Like, there's, yeah, but there's, there's time digit, doing this. But the digit processors are so much faster than the, the bus to write it with now. The digit 6 is... Yeah, but you're still taking time to do this. Like, there's right. a process that... You see the stuff, and you have to pick and choose while the pictures are coming in. Yeah, so there's still there's still a process. This there, will be but... slower than what it is now. I don't know the process. Is you're making like... you're making a decision. So you're, you're adding yeah. a, you're adding a piece of I/O no matter what you do. If you add this, because if you're writing to raw, you're writing to raw. Yep. If you're writing to this, this is going to choose and then pick one or the other. That's true. It will take the whole raw yeah. image and then make a decision. So it's choosing before it's actually written. So it's yeah. you're adding something. Doesn't mean it won't just be compensated for some way. But it's yeah, it's interesting. But the little picture they show for the for the yeah. patent application is kind of funny. It's like, hey, look, there's half for the, for the car. Then they have the whole car. Then they have the back half of the car. Then the picture below it is the car all out of focus. Yeah, it's blurry car, blurry car. Uh, I personally would just turn it off and shoot everything in RAW. I'm sure it would be an yeah. option because auto is always an option. It's not a requirement. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and Ken Rockwell would always shoot in JPEG because he doesn't want to run out of space in his cards. Yeah. I was surprised. I was honestly surprised. I was looking for something Nikon related and he didn't come up on the top of the Google search this week. Yeah, he's been doing other stuff. 
Yeah, but for a long time, his site was so SEO'd, like, t to such an extreme that he put in anything Nikon-related, and he would show up before Nikon. Yeah. And I think they got kind of pissed at him for that. Casio has made a split camera. It's a modular design that separates the lens from the sensor. Separates the screen from the lens, and the fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> so Casio, Casio's new XLIM EX-FR10 is a modular design. It's meant to be an action camera, like all your GoPros and everything else. They're trying to get in on it. The action difference is camera. the camera and the storage medium slash display are actually completely separate units. Now, they can click together, but they actually talk to each other over Bluetooth. Okay. So you can just have the camera out, and you can have it over here and be separate and look at your pictures or your video. Um, sure. It, it doesn't say anywhere, I even looked on their site, about whether you can do live view over Bluetooth. You probably can. Considering I, the way GoPros work, you have to be able to. There's no screen on it, so you, if you want to have any chance of framing something, you probably need some live view. So, but... Why? I don't know. Yeah, there we go. Like it's just I, I really I don't know. In a market where everyone's already smartphone based, going back to not smartphone based seems a little weird. It is rugged. It's been ruggedized. It can take a beating. Yeah. It's GoPro just announced one with a screen on the back for less money. Yeah, and they are asking for four hundred and eighty bucks for right. it. Yeah, it shoots 4K at 30 frames a second, and it's good to 120 meters or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, this seems like a half-assed attempt at making something new. I guess their whole point is to let you be able to put the camera in positions you wouldn't normally be able to put it in and still be able to see what it's looking at. I just don't see this. And it's nothing functionally more useful. Like, yeah, I don't know. Really. It comes in cool colors. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's an attempt at least they're they're trying to not they're, die. they're trying yeah it's something I, um, I haven't seen anything from Casio in a while Let's see I'd almost rather see a, I'd almost rather see a better cheaper all weather point and shoot you know like that's I feel like that would be a better yeah for four hundred eight dollars I can buy a Nikon AW one or whatever when they make a new one which shoots better pictures is the same size and is more rugged and more weatherproof and that's true uh, it's just a strange little. It's a straight little marketing ploy for a company trying to stay relevant. I didn't even realize they were still around in the camera market. Like, I figured they were still making watches and calculators, and that was about it. I knew they were making some weird little stuff, but, you know. No. Oh. All right. So this next one I threw in here because I wanted to talk to you about this one. Yeah, this battery uh, stuff is coming a long way. Battery stuff is coming a long way. Um, there's a new company out there called Charge All, and they uh, claim they are trying to change the game of portable power in that their new Charge All portable batteries uh, have an AC outlet on them. Mm. Now, if you want to reach over and grab off that pole there, we have something that already does this, although and at about the same price point they're asking for. The whole thing, okay, this is a little bigger than what they're looking at. This is a Paul C. Buff Vagabond. It's meant for strobes, but it's basically a giant battery with two outlets and a USB port on it. Mm-hmm. And basically, it has a power inverter in the front end here, and it lets you go from the DC of the battery up to the AC of the outlets, and we can run the studio strobes off of it without having power. Yeah, and these are meant to be very industrial and used for strobes. So they're, the capacitor is very quick instead of where this is built to charge a laptop. This is built to fire a strobe, which is very, very quick. Yeah. This has a replaceable battery. So the battery is two parts. In fact, parts. you have to take the battery out just to charge yeah. it. So. so it's just a big piece of battery, which is separate and replaceable from a... Uh, a fan cooled series of capacitors which lets you get up to the 120 volts slowly where this is a 12 volt 14.8 volt big chunk of lithium battery yeah so yeah these are pretty widely used and very very trusted and used for a lot of things and they made this is this is the mini they made into like an extreme version the yeah new, with the new version which the is new a version bigger pack the, yeah which is so. a little nuts but 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 then you've got your onker, which I don't know. Yeah. I, I didn't have that ready on hand to pull um, it's it out. Sitting around somewhere, but, but that the onker is like many things. It's a um, a time to go replace the cameras at some point. But <laughs> it's a little uh, USB battery pack, which is yay big by maybe an inch or so, I and that's yeah. um, 
that's enough to charge a cell phone a couple of times or a tablet once or twice, an older tablet. Those are 10,000 milliamp hours. I don't know if they were talking about these are 18, these are 18, 18 and 20 before the 20,000 milliamp hours. So like a new, a new Anker battery pack is about 20,000 milliamp hours. This is kind of expensive for what it is, but it has the inverter. So that's, it, yeah. And I think that's where they're getting away with charging two to four times as much as the Anker. Yeah. So this is, this is, well, the new Anker is about 80 bucks. These are between right, so about 200 and $250. Yeah. So. An Anker is, say, the same amount of capacity, but it doesn't have an inverter to go to AC power, which is what the actual plug thing is. Yep. This is the same size battery with a built-in built in inverter. Yep. So, I mean, $200 is not a ridiculous amount of money to spend on an inverter with a good size lithium battery, knowing that it'll last you a couple of years, it'll stay very yeah. fresh for that amount of time. So, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. It's obviously very Apple marketed, it being white. Um, yeah. It's white, and the picture shows them charging uh, an iPad, an iPhone, and an I, uh, Mac Air. And and both the iPad and the iPhone are white. Yeah. Well, they're all the same color, because yeah. Because you know Apple. Apple. Um. Yeah. Oh, they're eating. What are they eating? They're eating. Um. It's like a burrito. No, they're they're paninis, paninis, and oh, they're paninis. bow tie salad. Oh yeah. So yeah, they're hipsters. Apple. Yeah, he's wearing flannel too, in case you're wondering. I'll I'll put the picture up. Yeah. Oh, they're on a really distressed wooden table, too. This is the best. Like, are you a hipster? Buy this one. <laughs> distressed, reclaimed wood table. They're on two different plates with two different cups. Cashmere and... Flannel. Flannel. Yeah. Yep. Hipster battery. So it's the hipster version. It's the right Anker. marketing, obviously. It's hipster. Also. It's just... So they probably paid some serious money for that marketing. Probably. <laughs> yep. All right. The charge all is also pretty good. I like the name. It's I like the name because you can charge everything too. It's it's perfect. All right. Let's put this away now. All right. So. I will show you this video, and I will loop this video over I, and over again. I need again. to see this. I didn't get a chance to look at it. It's a Vine, so it's recording. only six seconds long. It is the most painful video I've ever seen. In fact, I'm just going to tell you right now. Is it just the mount? Is it? Okay, keep going. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to insert this in here, probably right over me talking. It, if, if you don't like to see very expensive things get destroyed, you might want to just skip ahead about seven seconds. Almost. I mean, that is close. He caught us. And... <laughs> But foot hit the pylon. Yeah. Almost. I mean, that is close. He caught us. And <laughs> that video was uh, of a football player from Oklahoma, Go Sooners, um, <laughs> making the amazing catch in the end zone and then landing on a Canon 1DX with what was either a 400 millimeter 2.8. Or a 500 millimeter f4 because the video is not clear enough hmm. to uh, be able to tell which one it is, and at that length they're about the same, about the same shape and size. The lens is toast. Like they picked it up, it, it's toast. You want to you want to know what the difference between a wide receiver and, and, a, and a even an L lens is? The wide receiver is going to win. <laughs> um, I have to see this video. I don't. I oh, it's I'm really frightening. Curious, so. The monopod snapped off of the bottom. The lens breaks off at the mount. The lens, there's pieces of glass that pop out of the front element. Uh, yeah. Uh, assuming the one D the one DX is repairable. The one DX is probably fine. The one DX is probably fine. The mount might have broken, yeah. but you can replace the mount. Um, they they're saying that the repair range could be any or the replacement range could be anywhere from ninety five hundred to seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. Deductible. Yeah. Yeah. So the insurance is obviously paid up. The, so the insurance it's not. Yeah. If you're if you're taking that shot, you better have your insurance paid up. But yeah, that is a disturbing video to watch. And yeah. then, and then it's on Vine, so it loops over and over again. I have to find that. That's um, <laughs> that's pretty funny. I have to look. It, it is pretty funny. And and yeah, it's off. Oh. And the best part is like the it has the the ESPN announcer. Oh yeah. On it on the Vine. And, of course, he knows nothing about cameras, so he's just like, oh, yep, he caught the ball. Ouch. That's a touchdown. I'm like, with the camera, the camera goes. Wasn't even professional football. No, it was college football at that. Sad. Well, there's still trillion dollars in college I football. I realize, just. 
if you're going to get hit by somebody, you may as well. Uh, yeah. So that from sucks. one exploding thing to another. Yeah. Uh, photographer accidentally catches a fireball meteorite on his time lapse night sky time lapse. So um, Ben Lewis accidentally, while he was sleeping, apparently captured a really a rather rare long long trail fireball meteorite. So he's on a Canon 6D, yep. uh, 35 millimeter, 1.4. Yeah, 6D club. Woo yeah, could have been better. 10 seconds at ISO 1600. Uh, 10 second delay between frames, which means it must have been a rather long trail for it to get a couple of frames right. so you can really see it. Uh, the American Meteor Society put this on the front page of the time watch video and stuff, and they could identify that it was a kind of a longer, a longer than normal glowing trail fireball, which is really cool. Um, I've seen a couple of different kinds and some rarer stuff in my life, but I love I love this kind of stuff. Um, oh, I know that's why I made sure this got in here because it's, it's totally a Ryan. Well, that, that, I mean, that's one of those things that you, there's no like rhyme or reason to. It's just you need to be outside. Like, yeah. There's no other way to deal with that other than be outside a lot at night. Yeah, they were saying that there's some of the um, astronomers who who've been trying to capture something like this for decades and they've never seen it. It literally it's it's, it's just you can be at the right place at the right time and you know you don't even have to be awake apparently. Yeah, I, I he didn't actually see it, which is really funny. Like, yeah. Ha ha, he didn't see it. But it's it's cool. I, I've never really captured anything cool with a camera because that's I put that really secondary to actually seeing things. Yep. But it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a funny story. He didn't see it. Also, that's one of the reasons I want a GoPro Hero 4 is to do long exposure time lapse, kind of like oh, do time lapses with that. Because you can do that with those. Yeah, you can do some pretty good stuff with that. Be, be fun. Yeah. So there's a little little story that just popped up. This only caught my eye because of, you know, being a portrait photographer, this one kind of caught my eye. It was about, um, they're, they're talking about um, the actress uh, Joan Crawford, and she, there's, a, there's a number of very famous photo photographs of her, but someone actually found the original negative to one of the shots they did as a movie promo, like before it was photoshopped, for lack of a better term. Which you know they've been doing as long as we've been making negatives. Uh, so the you know uh, the side by side comparison. I mean, it doesn't look immensely different, but they cleaned up a couple, you know, like freckles and and blemishes, and smoothed out the skin tone a little bit and adjusted the light a little bit. All the things you would do in Photoshop now, except they were doing it by literally moving things around and like using pencil shavings to cover up parts of it as the light passed over and. Uh, hmm. So, yeah, th th this is from the 30s. So it's not like, you know, someone... This was when it actually took a lot of skill to, to alter a photo. Not like what I can do now with three clicks of a button and boop, boop, yeah, done. It's up until a couple of years ago. Yeah. That was, it, took, it took an immense amount of skill to do. Yeah. I and mean, even to do it right, it still takes a ton of skill and a oh, ton absolutely. of time. But, uh, but yeah, so No, it's very cool. But they, they were saying that the... Um, the, the the photographer was George Hurwell, and, but the uh, the lesser known person involved in this whole process was the retoucher named James Sharp, and they said it would take him up to six hours per image. So they would have to absolutely pick the ones they wanted retouched before they'd start. Well, yeah. Because it would take him up to six hours per image to get everything just right. Yep, I can see that. So. That's, um, having spent what time I have in a dark room, I can see that very yeah. easily. Six hours is like a professional person doing that who knows how to do it as quickly as possible. Yeah. That's six hours. Yeah. So. That's very cool. Yeah. No, I, that, so that one I just kind of crept in there because it's one of those things is like you don't usually see things coming out of the vault like that and to be able to compare with the, with the picture we all have on file, or I say we all have on file, but the picture that everyone knows yeah. that was retouched and then finally someone finding the negative and reprinting it with the original and going, oh, wow, well, they really did retouch photos even back then. Hmm. So, Ryan, what if I told you you could have a lens that goes from 50 to 1,500 millimeters? Would you is want that 15, lens? Is it 1,500 or is it 1,000? It's 1,000 with a built-in 1.5X teleconverter, so it can uh, go all the way up to 1,500. That's very cool. Would, would you would you want to uh, to play with this lens? Would you oh, want to have this lens? That's very cool if you have a D1C or a red epic dragon, or a C100, 300, 500. Meh. 
<laughs> something that can record in 4K, because that's yeah. what this lens is designed for. Although it is a standard EF mount, and they have put it on a 1DX. Okay. That's so, probably pretty funny. That it, well, I mean, the 1DC and the 1DX are the same body. Yeah. So, so you could use it to take stills, but it's not recommended. This would be the new Canon CineServo 50 to 1000mm T 5.0 to 8.9 Ultra Telephoto Zoom Lens, hmm. which Canon just announced today on their website. Um, it's only 14.6 pounds. It's only 14.6 pounds. And, you know, only expected to be about $78,000. That's, that's very good. That actually is pretty good for what it is. I mean, it's meant for broadcast... Yeah, it's meant for a very, very specific thing, but yeah, it's, it's an immense amount of money. It's, it's, just, it's just one of those things, you, you know, sometimes you hear people say, oh man, I wish I had one lens that covered this bigger range. Well, if you want it. What do you need, a 10 minute zooming shot? Like, is that the whole point of this? It's just like a 10 minute <laughs> zoom in as they walk away that goes on for way too long? I don't know how, how you'd need that range while you're filming. I don't know. Well, I, I, I don't have any concept of that because when I've filmed with 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 Jesse and when I've done other video stuff, it's like I find one stop. I've done a couple of zoom, you know, zoom. Creep I've done kind tons of, of zoom, zoom stuff, but that seems excessive. Like the the shot that you want to take with that is so immense. I want to know what you're gonna do with fifteen hundred millimeters of zoom. <laughs> well, it's it's obviously a, it's a panning through a, a scene into something very specific, but yeah. that's pretty nuts. I don't know how many people actually have the, the balls to make that scene happen. Like, I have no idea. Uh, it does have an 11 blade aperture. So you get very, very, very smooth bokeh. Yeah, you'll need it at 1,000 millimeters because there's nothing in focus, basically. <laughs> and it, I, because it's a cinema lens, they're putting it in T-stops, not F-stops. Yeah. Um, it will do T-stops as low as 2.8. But that, or f stops, I mean, as low as 2.8, but there's no need for that except for the depth of field. Yeah. I mean, you have more so control like, over the depth of field than you do with the. At f2.8, it's still. It's like still a T5. T5. Yeah. It's still T5 at that point. So you're still only getting the, the light transmission as if it was at 5. That's pretty crazy. I wonder how many of those things they actually make. Like, how many of those lenses that they actually produce? I don't know. Probably not many. They probably Curious. produce to order, to be honest with you. They have to have... They must make a stock of but they have to. Amount. But they have to know how many that they're going to produce. Like, yeah. There has to be a certain number that they need to produce. Like, they can't make one or five of them and not make them again. Yeah. So who knows? But yeah, I'm curious. I just thought it was really cool that they, like, they, they made this lens that's like this long and covers a zoom range beyond that of the normal human conception. Yeah, it'll be a, it's a cool shot, but you, it's a shot you can also sort of fudge with other lenses. But. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it's just one of those, you know, how often have you looked at your lens and said, oh, man, if only this was a little longer, a little shorter. Well, you could never, I mean, unless you're talking about ultra-wide, you could never complain about that with this lens. Yeah, it's it's cool. It's it's kind of a pushed extreme and, lens. Yeah, and, nice and to... this caught my eye because uh, about a week ago, um, I saw a blog post someone was talking about, you know, someone once asked me, how come I can't have a, a 24 to 300? And the guy's response was, well, you can. And it was a Sigma cinema lens that was, or maybe a Tamron cinema lens. It was one of the third parties. That was a 24 to 800. Hmm. It was a cinema lens, same, similar, similar to this. And he was like, you could have that lens. And then he puts it next, like the picture has like that one next to his um, 7200 stacked on top of his 2470. And it goes, and it's still like a foot taller than the, than the two of them stacked on top of each other. Yeah, it's like the same reason the, the 24 to 105 versus... 24 to 105 is an f4 versus an f2.8 because the f2.8 yeah. would be like this big around by yeah. this big and it wouldn't make any sense to have no but although that the rumor of the uh the sigma 7200 f2 they need to update their 7200 2.8 so no, i think this is going to be the replacement for it i would hope so because they really need to update their old one sucks so yeah well that's i think that's why they're going to introduce the f2 under the art line as the replacement yeah, you're, you don't buy the Sigma seventy two hundred. You buy the Tamron if you're not going to buy first party. Yeah, they need to do something to push to push the other two. I, mean, I think the F two would be a huge push on the other two. They'd have to actually come out with something comparable. Yeah, I mean, 
it's a full the other, stop the other, the other two both have their problems, so it's... Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so that's it for this week. That, that is all I've sure. got for news this week. Uh, we are not forgetting about you guys. I know we only did one episode last week. Uh, we've just been really, really busy. What day is it? <laughs> yeah, what, day, what day is it is a good question. I'm never quite sure anymore. Um, you know, Ryan was crazy all over the place last week with jobs and no, this, um, this two weddings this weekend too. Yeah, you got two weddings this weekend coming up, so hopefully we'll get one more recorded before you get, get. Into wedding mode. And uh, I did some construction. I think it's out of frame now, but there's a. I'm going to put a time lapse up. Out there. of frame. Sorry. I, yeah. Well, it's out of frame as it is because I screwed up the construction. And, might have to start over. Again. You're so good at wood. <laughs> I am fine. <laughs> my my design was fine. My layout was fine. I can't freehand a circular saw. I thought you had a thing. No, I don't own a miter saw. I thought you did. No, Chris had the miter saw, and I asked him if I could go use it, and he's like, "Well, I'm in Oregon until Thursday." Well, so I might go buy more wood and go to his house Thursday and cut yeah, it. Yeah, I think I have one too. But anyway, so that's. So there'll be a time lapse of that up just because I took That's one. That's fun. Because I had nothing better to do while mm-hmm. I was doing construction. I still haven't um, told me what that's for yet, but... Well, you never told me what the whisk was for from the beginning I of the I told you what the whisk was for immediately. <laughs> we never me. told them what the whisk was for. The yeah, that's because I haven't had time to do it and I don't have time to explain <laughs> it or do it, so fuck. <laughs> I don't have time to do it because it takes a little while. <laughs> and, All right. Yeah. So we'll <laughs> see you later. still wet like i hate that so much it's not <laughs> quite dry is your hair ever dry yes it's often very dry because i have to <laughs> drive with the window down <laughs> so what have we got today uh canon is going to tell you whether or not to put your camera in... ah, damn it do it over again what a fucking shit okay i'll no i'll, I'll if you're going to say that one i'm going to say something funnier about that one I, I i had something funnier and then i screwed it up trying to get it out <laughs>